Hey, what's up everybody and welcome back to News Dose and Woo! Alright, so things are starting to get really hot in here. I, I know we've talked a lot about Activision Blizzard here lately. In fact, we talked about them just yesterday. Of course, they posted yet another update right after that video. But I did tell you all, there, there's going to be a lot of these updates here in the coming months. Today, though, I, I don't know if we're going to get something quite as spicy as this again because Brazil. They did post their findings, and yes, they did approve the deal with zero, yes, zero restrictions. So this was just an all-around win for Xbox and Microsoft. But what was so crazy about all of this is Brazil's official response on why they decided to give the acquisition an okay. And I think from a community standpoint, we already kind of understood a lot of this. I mean, we've talked about this on the channel over and over and over again, but here... Brazil, they basically called out Sony for their hypocritical and exaggerative statements. So we're going to go over all of that today and what this means going forward. And if you want to skip right to that part of the video, of course you absolutely can. That is why I have those timestamps after all. However, we do also have several other interesting things to talk about as well, including EA's big push into those controversial $70 games. Per usual though, before we get started, if you do like this type of stuff, I am here every week, Monday through Friday, so do make sure to hit those buttons below. Like, subscribe, and do hit that bell. Without a further ado though, let's just go and jump right into things, starting off with Platinum Games. I think by this point, if you regularly watch this channel, you probably know I, I do like Platinum Games very much. That I think they're a fantastic studio that makes great games like Nier Automata, Bayonetta, Astral Chain, etc, etc. However, one thing that all of those games share in common is that they're all single player driven experiences. And they did diverge from that a little bit this year with a new live service game being Babylon's Fall. Unfortunately for fans and for Platinum Games themselves, that game was a major, major flop, and in less than one year, it got so bad to the point that it's already been shut down. So I think a lot of fans of theirs, they kind of looked at this news as, okay, well, their experiment with live service games, it just didn't pan out, and they'll, they'll just go back to solely focusing on those single player experiences, and well, wrong. That's not what's happening here, because their CEO in an interview with the Video Game Chronicle told them this. There's a lot that we've learned from this experience, and it's not changed our future plans or outlook moving forward regarding doing live service games at all. Live service games are definitely something that we want to do and put our effort in moving forward. So, there it is. Babylon's failure will not dissuade them from making more of these live service games going forward. And I guess it is what it is by this point. I've said this before, I guess I'll just say it again here, but I feel like certain companies are chasing this mythical cash cow being live service games. Yes, there are some major successes out there. We've seen it, we've, we know about these games, but there's also a ton of failures as well. Of course, these companies are not gonna focus on that as much, but it does appear that these are high risk, high reward games. Now, I guess we'll see if Platinum can pull it off, but Babylon's Fall, it doesn't really instill a lot of confidence. I'll, I'll just kind of say that. The good news here, though, is that Platinum is also working on other games as well, such as Bandana 3 that's coming out later this month. Looks really good. So for fans of their single-player games, you know, they're not completely and 100% putting all of the resources on live service games. So it might be a little bit of a silver lining there. Now, I also want to talk a bit about the new NVIDIA graphics card being the RTX 4090. People are starting to get this thing in their hands now, and that realization of just how massive this thing is is starting to become much more clear. Some different pictures are starting to hit the internet, and just check this thing out. Here's the picture of the 4090 side by side with the Xbox Series X and the PlayStation 5. I mean, just look at this thing. This is actually crazy. I mean, one of the big stories leading into this generation was how big the Xbox Series X and the PlayStation 5 is. It's not like these are small consoles. These are big consoles, and a lot of fans heading into this generation were concerned that they might be too big for their own TV stands. But here, you have the 4090, just a GPU alone and nothing else, and it's right there in terms of size. Of course, the 4090 is super powerful as well. I mean, we can't forget about that. But we are seeing just how big these graphics cards are starting to become. Really, by this point, the, the next Xbox will actually be the size of a real full-size refrigerator. 
Let's just go and move right on over to the big story of the day, though, because I know a lot of you all want to hear more about that Microsoft Activision Blizzard acquisition. I believe this really is the first significant update that could potentially cause a bit of a ripple effect. What's happening here, though, is that, yes, Brazil's regulatory body being Cade did unveil their findings, and they did decide that this deal is completely 100% fine. Not 98%, not 99%, but 100% fine. That means that there's no concessions and no restrictions whatsoever on this deal. In other words, or at least in Brazil, if Microsoft wanted to make all of their Activision Blizzard games exclusive to Xbox, they could absolutely do something like that if they wanted to, no problem. Now, to be very clear, I'm not saying that's what's going to happen here, and I suspect that it actually won't be the case, but this is important in the sense that it shows you that's what Brazil felt about this buyout. But let's just not take my word here, because Kate, they did actually post their own response, and considering what we know, this is very, very, very juicy stuff. Of course, Sony has been very active complaining to these regulators. We all know about this. It's been very public by this point. So, yeah, a lot of Cade's response was uh, directed towards Sony to the point they actually specifically called out PlayStation. Wasn't quite expecting that, but let's just go and check out the three key quotes from their response because we do need to talk about these. These are very important, not just in Brazil, but also for these other regulatory bodies as well. We'll get into that here in just a little bit. The first of which, though, is that they said it is important to highlight that the central objective of Cade's activities is the protection of competition for Brazilian consumers and not the defense of the particular interest of specific competitors. Yeah, they, they, they pretty much made it very clear there who they're talking about here. I mean, we've seen Sony statements already, and here they are saying that this is not about protecting your market lead. This is about the consumers and protecting them. We are not here to protect your market lead. But let's just kind of continue on to the second part where they say, investment in exclusive content is and always has been very important for competitive dynamics in the console segment. Exclusive content was most likely one of the main factors responsible for positioning the PlayStation as a leader in the console market for more than two decades. Now, this remark is a little bit more amusing because they flat out called out Sony here. I mean, in that first quote, they were being a little bit more on the vague side of things, but then they were kind of like, nah, we might as well just go and let it all on the open here. But more importantly, what have I been saying all along? We have talked about this on this channel over and over and over again. Sony... They, they did this to themselves. See, what Sony wants to do is they want to make this big stink about, oh, if Call of Duty is exclusive, we, we cannot compete. It damages the entire market, and how dare Microsoft acquire a company to boost their exclusive count. And somehow, we apparently, I guess, are just supposed to ignore what Sony has been doing for years, really since the inception of the PlayStation brand. PlayStation is known for exclusive games. They not only acquire studios for exclusives, I mean, they acquired Naughty Dog, they acquired Insomniac Games, they acquired studio after studio after studio, but on top of that, they also pay third-party developers, third-party publishers for exclusivity. Look no further than Street Fighter V, look no further than Final Fantasy VII Remake, Final Fantasy XVI, Forspoken, the countless timed exclusives such as Deathloop, Ghostwire Tokyo, and the list goes on and on and on. This is just the last few years but the evidence it's out there it's not like we can't see this type of stuff this has been a primary strategy for playstation since the inception of the brand so it's like them just kind of saying they're allowed to do it but now how dare another publisher try to do the same thing that's the problem with their entire argument. Sony does the exact same thing, and for us as a game community, I think most of us understands that. I know some people out there, they'll, they'll willingly try to ignore this stuff, they'll act like Sony doesn't do these things, but they do. They always have. It's just now the only difference is, is that Microsoft is now working on a much grander scale because they have more money. 
At the end of the day, though, I still don't believe Microsoft will make games like Call of Duty exclusive to Xbox. They claim they won't, and, and I don't think that they will. I, I believe this acquisition is more for Xbox Game Pass than it is about exclusivity. What's so interesting about all of this, though, and the zero restrictions, is that a regulatory body is pointing out the irony of Sony's complaints just so blatantly. And, and this is something that other regulators will see as well. It was always expected for these regulators to go into the second phase of their 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 investigation. Th this was never a surprise, but I think the further they look into it, of course, they're going to see this stuff. Now, they might not necessarily come to the same conclusion as Cade, we'll get to that in a bit, but they won't have to look far to find Sony has been doing this for a very, very long time. And that's something that I have been saying all along. Now, the last quote that I want to focus on, though, is where they say, As already seen, Nintendo does not currently rely on any content from Activision Blizzard to compete in the market. In turn, Sony has several predicates which should contribute to maintaining the competitiveness of PlayStation in a possible post-operation scenario. So this is something that we haven't really talked about, but this is absolutely true as well. Nintendo, they are living proof that Call of Duty is not the be-all, end-all, as Sony claims. In fact, Nintendo, they're selling their console at a record-breaking pace. That Nintendo Switch, when all said and done, might very well be the best-selling console of all time. Now, it's going to come close. I don't know if it'll get there or not, but yes, it's, it's selling very, very well. To go beyond that, though, Cade also pointed out that if Xbox were to make Call of Duty exclusive which is a very big if by this point, but hypothetically, if they do, sure, it would translate to increased sales for Xbox and Xbox Game Pass, but there are other competitive games out there that would rise in popularity on PlayStation, such as Rainbow Six and Battlefield. This is something that other publishers, in fact, have pointed out as well. So again, th these are things that we knew, but Cade, they're laying it all out in a very straightforward way, and this could be a big sign to come. This acquisition is still far from complete. This is just one part of a very long process, and they still have to get through some other major regulators out there, such as the FTC, the CMA, and then the European Commission. Those are the big three. But with Kate's findings here, which by the way, they are one of the more strict regulators out there, this is a good sign going forward as the other regions will look into very similar things. If one regulator sees these things, there's a good chance that these others will as well. Now, I've said for a while, and I'll, I'll just kind of say it again here, it will be hard for any regulator out there to just flat out say no, because as we're seeing here with Cage showing these things, Microsoft has a good case that has a great chance of holding up in court if one of these regions say no. Now, I think at most what you might end up seeing is some concessions made in certain regions. That's not really out of the realms of possibility. The FTC, as an example, Call of Duty is much more popular in the United States. So that might be more important to the FTC. But even then, we're just going to have to kind of wait and see. Of course, as always, though, I will keep you up to date on anything that we hear. So as soon as we hear more, I will let you know. But for the time being, uh, yes, this is a big win for Microsoft. And I think it's a great sign going forward. Now, I know that was a little bit of a longer topic and everything. My apologies. But but it is a big deal. One of the biggest stories in gaming history, actually. So I feel it needs to be thoroughly talked about. But we do have one other thing to go over today because EA, they did finally reveal Need for Speed Unbound. Now, it's about what we pretty much expected. This game already basically leaked out online. And we've talked about it a few different times. So this more or less kind of confirm some of the things that we already knew. It is indeed releasing on December 2nd for the Xbox Series, the PlayStation 5, and the PC as was previously leaked. So it is true, it is, in fact, a next generation only game. The new gameplay trailer, though, did reveal its more stylized art style, though. Again, this kind of leaked out yesterday online as well, but now we're seeing it in motion here, and I'm personally okay with it. I think that it kind of sets itself apart from some of its competition. It's not just another photorealistic racing game. I mean, we've gotten a lot of those throughout the years, so so I, I, I like this stylized take that they're going with, though I understand maybe not everybody necessarily will. I, I was reading through some of the comments earlier today, though, and, and it does seem like, for the most part, it's being well-received. What's not being well-received, though, is its price. So for the third time in about a week, EA has announced a $70 price tag. Earlier this week, Dead Space Remake, that got a $70 price tag. I believe Wild Hearts is $70 as well, correct me if I'm wrong there. And now here, we're also seeing the same thing with Need for Speed Unbound. So it's now become rather clear. EA, 
they have fully jumped on board that $70 train. And I really think by this point, if it's not already the new standard, it's quickly coming. A lot of different publishers are starting to do this, and I think that we'll slowly but surely see most publishers eventually go in this direction. I know not everybody is necessarily thrilled about this situation, and we, we will continue to see a lot of backlash online, but it does seem like $70 games has done relatively okay on the market, and because of that, as we're seeing here, we're probably going to see a lot more of them going forward, despite some of that online backlash. Let me know what you all think about this, though. I do want to hear your opinions in the comments below. Speaking of opinions, though, let's just go and jump into the poll of the day, though. Of course, I've been asking you all all week long what your favorite generation of platform was, whether that be with Xbox, PlayStation, Nintendo, and now... It's time to take a look at Nintendo handheld consoles, where I asked you all, what handheld console is your favorite generation of Nintendo? And yes, I'm not including hybrid designs here, so no Switch, but as we take a look here, the 3DS, surprisingly, I, I was not expecting this, the 3DS did come out on top with 34% of the votes, Game Boy Advance, that took second place being 30%, 20% being the DS, and 16% went to the Game Boy and Game Boy Color. So yeah, the 3DS did come out on top here. I thought this was very interesting. Though I can't really say that I'm disappointed. I actually like the 3DS a lot myself. And for me, it really just comes down to the 3DS and the Game Boy Advance. While I do like all of these platforms, those are probably my two personal favorites. I do think that both have fantastic library of games, I, especially with the Game Boy Advance. I think that that thing has aged incredibly well. But let's just go ahead and take a look at some of the comments here. Here you have Mooseman saying that the Game Boy Advance SP was my favorite. The clamshell design made it easy on the pockets and it was the first rechargeable Game Boy. Now I just knew I had to highlight this comment because the SP was actually my favorite Game Boy Advance as well. That backlight was such a huge, huge difference maker. And yes, it having that rechargeable battery as well. I, I remember the days with the Game Boy Color and the original Game Boy Advance and having that magnifying glass peripheral where it had that light attached. Yeah, it didn't exactly help out all that much, and that was actually one of the real struggles with some of those original Game Boy devices. Let me know, though, if you all had that peripheral as well. I believe mine was the Mad Cats, and yeah, it didn't exactly work. But yes, I think the SP is such an overlooked Nintendo handheld. That thing was amazing for its time. And then here you have Blackstorm saying, I chose the Game Boy Color strictly because it's the handheld I took to elementary school and had Pokemon battles and trade with. It showed that I wasn't alone as a gamer and there was a lot of other people like me, both boys and girls. In my family, there was only three gamers, and I was one of them. If I were to talk games, it would probably be Game Boy Advance or the 3DS, but these comprise of all the handhelds I've owned from Nintendo. And yeah, I remember those days as well. Pokemon was a true phenomenon in the 90s, and I remember bringing Game Boy to school, playing them with your link cables. I, you know, the, the Pokemon cards and that the teachers, you know, they like, they'd like to take that stuff away from us. But it, it did seem like every kid at the time played Pokemon. I mean, Pokemon, quite frankly, I, I could say was my childhood, but the thing about what you said is that it made you feel as if you weren't alone as a gamer. I don't know if I necessarily realized that at the time, but it is true now that I think about it. It really did make gaming more social, and this is before all of the online connectivity that we saw from Xbox Live years later. So that's interesting now that you kind of point that out. Good point by Blackstorm. Now for this last comment here that I wanted to highlight, Jacob, and I, I, th I think that he kind of wrapped this up in a nice little bow where he said, I've enjoyed playing all the different handhelds by Nintendo. The original Game Boy was such a step up from the old crystal screen games and light games that were first created before the Game Boy existed. The initial love for playing Tetris will not be forgotten. However, the truth is no system listed is a bad system. Each offers some amazing games, and I believe the success of these handhelds has led to the innovation Nintendo has found with the Switch. Kudos to Nintendo for finding a way to innovate two technologies together so we can enjoy our home games as handheld ones. And you are absolutely 100% correct here in everything that you said. All these consoles are great consoles and they're beloved for a reason. They had true impact on so many games out there. To this day, I still credit the Game Boy Color for getting me into gaming with Pokemon Red, Pokemon Blue, and Pokemon Yellow. While I had already played games by this point, I had played things like Duck Hunt, Donkey Kong Country, I, I, had, I had played plenty, plenty of games by this point, but these are the games that truly, truly absorbed me into their world. But like you said, what Nintendo is doing now 
is the true embodiment of what made both their handheld and home consoles successful. And we are still seeing to this day that magic of having a console in your hand thanks to the Switch, that personalized experience that we remember for years and years. Anyways, though, that's it for this episode. But if you liked the video, don't forget to bow notification and subscribe button for more content just like this. Also, if you'd like to support the channel through Patreon, thank you for making this content possible. Peace out.